Welcome to the Mavs Fans for Life podcast. I am Landon Thomas, joined by my co-host, as always, Sean Avaz Makani. Make sure y'all subscribe to the channel and both of us as well on social. On today's episode, we're really just wrapping up the the calendar year of 2023. We're going to level set, see where the Mavs are right now and what's ahead of them. And then also Luca, 10,000 points for his career. And we'll finish off with the mailbag, the second mailbag this season. Um, And then we'll end with the New Year's resolution for the Dallas Mavericks. There might be a lot in that conversation. (laughs) So Sean Avaz, just starting out, just level setting where the Mavs are right now. Uh, They're 18 and 14. They're currently six seed, um, as we talked about before the pod. Um, they own the tiebreaker with the Pelicans, but just where they're at right now with the injuries that they've had with Kyrie, Maxi, Josh Green, who just came back, and also Lively as well for a little bit, what has stood out to you overall where the team is? You know, it's it's one of those things where you can take, you can kind of look at it both ways, I think, right? You can look at it from the the perspective of the Mavericks are missing their second best player, right? Kyrie's yeah. been out for a couple of weeks. Maxie's been out. feels like the whole season because he was yeah. playing awful before he got injured anyway. So it's like, he wasn't even, you know, a part of the team. Um, you know, Josh Green for, for all of his struggles. I mean, that gives you another wing defender that you're missing. And, and, you know, obviously lively, we've seen what a, what a big asset he is. And, and with him out of the lineup, this is a completely different team. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I think, you look at it and they're kind of treading water at this point, right? They're beating the teams they should beat and they're, you know, losing to the teams that we would expect them to lose to. I think, um, I, 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 you look at at this team last year in comparison, if, if, you know, these injuries were happening, I mean, you would have seen them drop. I feel like they would have been under 500, um, you know, and, and it's a testament to, I think Luca being in, in, fantastic shape this year right i think we've seen we've seen him even though he's kind of carrying the load a little bit more i think he was averaging close to 40 minutes a game in december um you know he's obviously shouldering the load but it looks easier for him which is kind of hard to believe but you know it it seems like it's it's coming easier to him and and we're not seeing him gassed in the fourth quarter um you know hardaway's been playing great you know aside from a couple of games here and there exum has been been excellent um and and Derek Jones Jr has been fantastic. So you've got pieces around that that kind of mask some of the deficiencies of this team. Um yeah. it's just hard to put a gauge on what they are with all the injuries. You know, it's it's really difficult when you're missing three key rotation players that you know give you a little bit more um a little bit more juice. I mean, we've seen games, you know, luckily against San Antonio, but guys like AJ Lawson playing almost 20 minutes, you know, Dexter Dennis playing a lot of minutes. Um you know, we're seeing Markeith Morris get extended minutes. Like guys that that are you know G League players or riding the bench are are getting you know getting a lot more playing time, and so it's really hard with the injuries, I think, to really assess kind of where this team is. But I, I you know, that being said, I think for for what they have and what's what's on the court right now, I mean, they're treading water, and at least they're over five hundred. Because I think if you look back at this team last year, like I said, I I, I think they would be miles under and i i think they're right where we thought they were right we said at the beginning of the season we thought this team was probably a seven seed six seed maybe and that's kind of where they are right now you know and it's going to fluctuate because the the west other than minnesota and denver i think it's like a game game and a half you know um between like the three seed and the 10 seed so it's very much like last year where you've got to just kind of keep your head above water and and kind of figure out where you're going to fall into that into that mix yeah it is it's tough right now because they are just trying to keep above water with these injuries in it and also in in parallel to the injuries you know you're trying to rest Luca as well because he he's playing all these games which is great you know he's healthy but yeah. he's carrying the load without Kyrie and, and you're seeing surprises with Dante Exum and Derek Jones Jr. Um, and and just lively as a whole since we're talking about the um, holistically the season itself you know, but it, it's it, it's tough because we, we we said this team would be seventh seed at full strength. Yeah. So what they're doing right now at, at sixth seed, 
And you look at the big picture here with Kyrie potentially coming back very soon. And Max, who knows when, but Josh Green just came back. We haven't seen much, but, um, yeah. you know, he's getting back into, you know, you need a full, um, probably four or five games to get back into where you were. And I kind of, I'm kind of happy where they're at right now. I mean, to, to, cause you, you look at the, the standings and, you know, we, we, we predicted where we thought the Mavericks were going to be, but we didn't really predict other teams because we, we, we talked mm-hmm. about we talk about the Mavericks. We cover the Mavericks. But when you look at the standings, you have the Lakers at eight. You have the Suns at 10. Uh, you have the, the Warriors at 11. And those are the teams that we thought were going to be at the top of the Western Conference. So I'm happy where the Mavs are right now at six. But at the same time, if either of those teams catch you know get back to where they're supposed to be you kind of get a little worried so you kind of hope that the Mavericks get healthy soon and then you know keep up the rhythm that they are with Luca and in Exum Derek Jones Jr. and Lively and um, THJ just keeping them above water scoring as many points as they are because it is going to be tough now that we are heading into the new year and you also know trade deadline is always a fun time so i'm just thinking because last year how the lakers got pieces and i'm not just talking about them but anyone in the western conference not even behind the maps but ahead of the maps if they get you know there's a lot of buyers this season so it's going to be very interesting how the next few months play out but right now i'm happy where they are yeah, and some of those teams you mentioned, like they're going through the same struggles that, that the Mavericks are with injuries. True. Right? Yeah. Missing Bradley Beal. Um, you know, that would be down. all season. <laughs> yeah, it feels like I think he's back tonight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But mm-hmm. that would be interesting to see, you know, how how long is he gonna play? Um, you know, Golden State's missing Draymond, which they're a completely different team without Draymond. Yeah. And LA without Gabe Vincent, you know, they don't really have a true point guard. You know, D'Angelo Russell's you know, kind of there, but, you know, combo scoring. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you're right. Like trade deadline coming up. I mean, this is the first time in a long time. I feel like the Mavericks are, are also in a position where they can make moves now, you know, you've got enough contracts on the books and you've got a lot of movable pieces where, you know, the Mavericks could be buyers to it, depending on, on what happens, you know, the pick situation obviously is not great, but you've got access now to, to future picks because that next one is going to convey this year. So, um, you know, it's, you're in a position where you can kind of fight with some of these other teams that, you know, that are going to make, or that are potentially going to make some moves. Um, and January is a, t- a tough schedule for the maps. I mean, let's, you know, I was just looking at me. I think they're playing, you've got games, you know, against the Celtics, um, you know, are coming to town. You've got games against the Lakers and the Warriors, um, you know, the Grizzlies now that, that John ja Morant is back. Uh, the Kings, Suns. Kings, later, Suns, Timberwolves. Magic. Twine. <laughs> yeah, like it's, January is a, a pretty hard stretch for the Mavs here. So I think we're going to learn a lot about who this team is. And, and the hope is, like you said, is that Kyrie's back and we can kind of see what this team is like full strength. Because when he was playing and this team was at full strength, they were a top three seed. You know, it was a very limited yeah. time, about like the first couple of weeks of the season. But you started to, you know, you were seeing kind of that chemistry that, that was built in the offseason. Um, and some of these games that the Mavs are losing, like, to Cleveland and, and Minnesota the last two games. Like if you had Kyrie, chances are you win you win both of those, right? Um, so you know, or even Luca playing last night against against Minnesota, you probably win that game. You know, so it's I, I think it's it's hard to judge what this team is right now, but I'll, to your to your point, I'm happy with with where they are and, and the situation that they're in. Yeah, like you said, it could be, you know, way worse. And and just harping on um, you know, the schedule right now uh before it gets to that point all those games that you're mentioning they really have a a opportunity here to really do something within the schedule because yes they have the warriors um and the jazz on the road coming up but they have like seven games in a row at home Mm -hmm. a homestand where you know you have the blazers twice you have the timberwolves who you know just beat you you really need to step up and um win that game because they beat you twice this season uh the grizzlies john morant's coming back 
Um, so that will be interesting. The Knicks, Brunson, the first time in Dallas playing. He yep. was here last season, but he didn't play that game. That was the game Luca had the 60 points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the Pelicans back to back. So that's going to be tough because you mentioned it before the pod that, you know, uh, uh, that could be crucial to them um, with tiebreakers um, with the Pelicans. Who knows how that ends up at the end of the season? So you really have to hone in and go at, um, you got to split this road trip right here with the Warriors and the Jazz. And then you got to take care of business at home. Mm -hmm. You have to take care of business on that homestand because you mentioned all the games after that. I mean, it's it's crucial. So that's very um, important. And then also another thing you mentioned was with the trade deadline pertaining to the maps because that's going to be interesting as well. Mark Cuban talked to us before the last home game, and he talked about selling majority stake of the Mavericks. And that comes into play with the luxury tax, the new yep. owners. They told them, do what you got to do. I want to win. And I think that stood out amongst everything. I don't care about the casino. I don't care about um, just the transaction of the trade. I mean, the, you know, the sell because he's still going to be around. The day to day is still the same. But that part, the luxury tax, because Mark Cuban, he's always been hesitant on going mm -hmm. full you know, full blown into uh, the luxury tax. Um, so they always, you know, they always found pieces, made it work, you know, try to get a bargain on trades and stuff like that. And um, signings like XM and Derek Jones Jr. But now it's time where you can take on money. And you mentioned it with the, the pick situation with New York. I mean, you, you have to be busy at the trade deadline or the off season because now, you have Kyrie long term. You have Luca long term at full max, and you got those two big hitters. Um, so you really have to be in the trade market, you know, because you don't have as much money as you would like. Especially if you re-sign Derek Jones Jr., who's going to be um, a free agent. You have Josh Green's extension kicking in, yep. and you have, um, you know, you have Maxi still making good money, and Grant Williams. I mean. It, it, it's go, it's going to be a time where Mavs have to trade and get talent to put them over the edge because they have great talent right now on the dollar. But, you know, you need that top talent to surround Luka and Kyrie to get them in contention. I think that's a big key what the owners want, especially coming in. We saw what the Suns did. You mentioned that with Bradley yeah. Bill and, and Kevin Durant. Those were the first two moves. So you have to make big powerhouse moves with the new ownership. Yeah, and, and I, I would be hesitant a little bit to kind of go full-blown and, and say, you know, okay, this team needs another superstar because we've seen the kind of the three-headed monster per se. That's true. That's it true. Work, right? It hasn't worked since Golden State. So, But with Kyrie's health, I mean, you kind of have to have a mainstay. Yeah. A you third do. guy, not you a superstar. Do. Right, I, and and I would say a, like a third guy, yes. I wouldn't say I wouldn't go full blown Phoenix because look at what's going yeah. on with them, right? Like when you've got three max players, <laughs> yeah, you have no bend, you have no depth whatsoever, you know. So it's either you know you're either going to complain that okay we have too many like you know role players on this team with Kyrie's health, or then or we're going to complain and say well we have no depth. Why did we make a, a trade like that? So it's it's a it, you know it seems like a lose lose situation at that point, but yeah. I have faith in Nico to be able, for him to be able to kind of assess the market and kind of see okay what what's a fit for this team right I think he's done a good job a great job actually the last couple of years you know especially after losing Brunson of kind of you know revamping this roster and and you know yeah. you've got Lively on a rookie deal now you've got Omax on a rookie deal set the sign for good money um you know Dwight's on a cheap contract. You've got movable pieces, even the Grant Williams trade or uh, signing, you know, that contract is movable. Josh Green's contract, not this year, but next year will be movable, you know. So you've got a lot of pieces where you can kind of move things around. And as we get into January, we'll start to see some of these teams that, you know, who's going to be sellers. I think it's hard to determine right now. Yeah. You know, Detroit looks like they're going to be in the tank, you know, the whole year. So are they going to start moving off some of the big men that they've got or even Bogdanovich? Like, is that a piece that you want to go after? The Bulls, you know, are the Bulls going to just say, you know, time to blow it up? You know, if the Jazz keep struggling, like there, there's a lot of teams out there that are kind of teetering on like, hey, you know, let's see what we can do. And I think Jan the first part of January, I think, is really going to 
you're really going to start to see some of that, some of that separation between these teams in both conferences. And that'll give you a better idea. So, okay, here's who we can kind of go after. Yeah. And, and I totally agree on that point where it doesn't have to be a superstar. I mean, obviously it would be nice uh, to have a third superstar in Dallas just for the, the, you know, the stability of uh, talent, um, you know, at the top level. Yeah. But as we've seen, and as you mentioned, I mean, it doesn't always work in most part. It, it, it never works. I mean, on, on the rare um, occasions, because you have to have the talent mesh together because if you have, you know, one, three, one, a guys, it always doesn't mesh. And that's the luxury with Kyrie. He can play on and off the ball. So if you bring a third guy, he has to be the same and he has to, it, it doesn't have to be an all-star, but it has to be a guy who can play on and off the ball, who can create their shot, but also shoot off the ball um, as well. And I'm just thinking just, big picture and it might not be during the season because i don't think you want to mess up what they have because like you mentioned we haven't seen them at full strength and they did look good for the few games that they did play a full strength and at the same time i mean you have expiring contracts in the off season you have thj becomes an expiring contract you have um rashawn holmes becomes an expiring contract Mm -hmm. So you have um, Steph Curry comes to expiring contract. You have three, you have 30 million of expiring contracts. And then you finally get the next pick out of the way. So you have future picks that you can trade, you know, later on. So it, it you, when you take that into account, you have to get a third guy. And I'm just thinking of the likes. It, obviously, I don't know if they're available or not, but talent wise, I'm thinking of the likes of Jeremy Grant or, mm-hmm. PJ Washington or you know st- guys like that that can be a third option but also don't require um don't need the ball at all times to be a one or two option they can be a two option if Kyrie's out for a few games you know you have to have that cuz when he's not out it's like the Cavs game Luka yeah. gets hot and then in the second half you know when other guys aren't making shots you know like the first half it's tough to beat teams. Yeah, and, and especially when you're going up against a Cleveland team that's the best defensive team in basketball. Like that's <laughs> yeah. e- even without Mobley. Even and, with exactly like they're very well coached. Like, you know, Bickerstaff and, and Greg Buckner, former Mav, have done, you know, a great job. And Jared Allen is just a beast. I mean and that's you know, and, and I think Jared Allen talked about it after the game, just kind of talking about Derek Lively. Like that's something Lively's gonna learn, right? Like you yeah. can't give up twenty three rebounds to it to Jared Allen. Like, that's just not, you're not going to win the game if, if you do that. And Lively, look, he's had his struggles this year, but I, I don't think there's anything negative we can say about the way he's played this year. Like, yeah. foul trouble is, you know, he's he's done a really good job recently of, of kind of staying out of foul trouble and, and really understanding, you know, kind of where to position himself. Um, and he's just going to get better. So you're right. I don't, I, I think as, as the season goes on, as January, you know, we get into January with this tough stretch, you get Kyrie back. Hopefully, fingers crossed, within the next week or so, um, you know, let's see what this team looks like at full strength. Like, let, let's see now that you're going to have, you've got Josh back, you know, you get Kyrie back, you've got Lively, you know, with Exum now moving into the starting lineup, you know, that gives you more depth of bringing Grant off the bench. Um, you know, it just, it, it adds another dimension to your team. So I, I, I don't think there should be any panic moves. And if necessary, you know, you wait till the off season and to your point go out and get a guy like Jeremy Grant, who's, you know, kind of stuck in Portland, or if Toronto blows it up, can you make a better offer than somebody else for OG and Anobi? Like that's, you know, guy, can you bring back Dorian back to, back to Dallas, right? Like those, those are some small, like some moves that you can make to, you know, to your point, not necessarily go after a superstar, but somebody who can kind of hold their own as, as a third or fourth option. Yeah. It just brings stability to your talent because, yep. you know, some of the guys, are just playing okay, but they're not playing good. Um, I mean, we we talked about it with our ratings, but you know, just thinking about Josh Green, thinking about Hardy, you even think about Grant Williams. I mean, he's averaging seven point eight points and in four rebounds, but his shooting is obviously one of the things that he's great at, and he's not doing it. He's in December. Um, th- that was his stats for December, and then the shooting 
is 37 percent and then from three is 30 percent and that's and we and we talked about it what he's done in the first 10 15 games and then after that it's been it's been you know a downfall and it, it's tough because now now he's kind of like Dwight Powell where now he's coming off the bench so you don't really you don't really focus on how he's playing as much as a starter and playing over 30 minutes, but you know, he's playing 20 minutes and he's, he's actually playing the backup five, Mm -hmm. which is good for the most part until you play him for long stretches. And that's where it hurts. And you mentioned lively. I think lively is doing good. It's, it's a, he's a rookie. So you're going to have a rookie wall for a few games. He'll be, he'll bounce back eventually in the next few games, but it's, but you, you have to have some sort of, support from a, t- a talent standpoint because you're you're running into a, a scenario where you're always going to be living or dying by the three yep. and that's that's the problem exum Derek jones jr grant thj you know josh green these guys can be as great as they are um in other areas of the game effort hustling you know defense um deflections all that stuff but if they're not making their three, then it's the Mavs aren't going to win games, especially if Kyrie's injured. So yeah. um, the good thing is Kyrie is warming up. Um, he's doing his pregame workouts. So hopefully in the next few games, or hopefully in the next couple games, we'll, we'll see some sort of you know status with him. But it, it, it's going to be interesting. That's all I'm going to leave it on. It's going to be interesting <laughs> in the next couple of months with trade deadline, not just Mavericks, just across the league because there's so many buyers like everyone especially with the play in tournament yep. now there's so many buyers but there's not as much sellers that's gonna be tough yeah and and you know we saw a play team last year make the finals right so it truly is like you if you get in like who knows anything can happen right so i, I think you're you're absolutely right in that point that you're gonna have a lot more buyers and sellers and does that lead to some overpays probably right like do, do you are, are other teams gonna kind of strip you know strip their assets down to, to kind of make, make one run or one or two, you know, teams like golden state, like, is this the last hurrah for them? You know, with clay, you know, clay's contract running out, you know, like, is this kind of their last, do they go all in with some of these young pieces and make a move to go and get somebody, you know, it, you know, just, that's just an example, but it's going to be really interesting to see to your point, you know, kind of how things shake out the, over the next month. Okay. So our next topic, Luke, Luke has some good news. Look at Doncic. Uh, 10,000 career points. I think officially it is at 10,078 points. But just overall, Luka Doncic, he tied Bob McAdoo for seventh fastest in terms of games in NBA history to reach 10,000 points. Seventh fastest. And then he's the sixth youngest player to reach 10,000 points. And he also reached 10,000 points in the fewest amount of games needed since Michael Jordan. And then he's the sixth Maverick to reach 10,000 points in Dallas Mavericks franchise history. First of all, Sean of Oz, just when you think about some of the, just the talking points I just mentioned, and then watching Luca as a whole and where the NBA is at today and then in the second point i want to ask you is just who he did it against (laughs) you know and they had the opportunity to draft him it seems like he's always happy to play phoenix and the clippers but those (laughs) but definitely phoenix what what is your thoughts on him reaching ten thousand at the rate he did and also who he did it against yeah I, i I think it's, it's it's an unbelievable feat. What what was it? He's the youngest active player, right? To yeah. to, to do it or the fastest so active. LeBron, player. KD, Steph yeah. Curry, all these players. Like, I mean, it's it's an incredible feat, and the fact that we got as Mavericks fans, the fact that we got to go from Dirk to Luca is you know incredible. Um, you know, and and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and and I think it's more evident the more you watch basketball, um, and today's NBA. Yeah, is European players that come over are so much more seasoned than G League players, 
you know, kids come in, you know, one year out of college, you know, kids have grown up playing AAU basketball, um, you know, because the European leagues are so, you know, they're professional leagues. Like, I think we forget about that sometimes. Like, even though, yeah. you know, these kids are playing, you know, when they're 13, 14 years old, they're professional leagues. Like, these aren't developmental camps, you know, that, you know, they used to be. Um, we've seen it with Dante Exum. You know, Exum played overseas for a couple of years and look at him now. You know, he should be in the running for most improved player. You know, um, it, it's it's kind of wild to to see that. And we've seen it with guys like Jokic and Giannis and Embiid and, and guys, you know, with these foreign players that come into the league. Embiid, you know, obviously played at Kansas, but guys that have played overseas that are coming into the league and kind of tearing things up. And I think I think more teams have started to take note of that. And you're starting to see more European players, more foreign players come into the league and, and, you know, be in a position to succeed. Um, and for Luca, it's just, I think this year he's having the best year of his career. You know, mm-hmm. I, you can clearly tell that he's conditioned. You can clearly tell that he worked his butt off in the off season to be where he is now. Um, his three point shot is, I think he's shooting the best three ball of his career. Um, he's taking more, he's making more, um, his usage rate. Different. His defense has improved, right? Like we've seen, we've seen him improve on the defensive end. The 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 yelling at the refs, it's still there, but it's 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 <laughs> gone down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you're starting to see the maturation, right? Like you're starting to see a more mature Luca at such a young age. Also, I think we we forget that he's so young. Yeah. Um, you know, and 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 people harp on the fact that okay, well, if he's a top five player, like how come the Mavs aren't you know perennial championship contenders? And look, I think you are when you've got a player like Luca. It's just a matter of putting the right pieces together, you know. And and you know, is that the case this year? We'll see because we're not at full strength. But you look at other players like LeBron didn't win a title until his seventh year. Steph didn't win a title until I think year six or seven. Same thing with KD. Like players don't win immediately when they're coming to the league. Jordan didn't win, you know, in his first six years. So to say that the Mavericks should win a championship within his, within Luca's first four years, five years in the league is, is kind of crazy um, because it takes time to kind of acclimate yourself to the game and kind of figure out who you are as a player and, and how to play with your other teammates and things like that. And I think you're starting to see that from Luca. You're starting to see him become a different, a different player. You know, we, we, we've, we knew the offensive game was there, but now you're starting to see him really put effort into his conditioning and into playing defense and, um, you know, hyping up his teammates, being more of a leader, like that's what you want from your franchise player. So I think I think it's an amazing feat. I think it's it's just a sign of things to come for for him um, and for the Mavericks organization. And then who he did it against? I mean, it's just <laughs> anytime Luca plays the Clippers or the Suns, it's must see TV. Like you know, he's going to put on a show. And and to your point, I think it it goes back to when they passed him up, right? Um, when they drafted DeAndre Ayton over him. Um, I think he also holds grudges against the Kings as well for taking Bagley and and for um, you know them talking you know Vivek Ranadiv talking crap about his dad. Um, yeah, you know I think it goes back to that, and I think it goes back to the the conference semis two years ago, right? Just that that hard fought seven game battle, and and then the Mavericks just blowing the water you know out of out of Phoenix, and and you know the Devin Booker stare down and and the fight they got into last year. Like I, I think it's just it's all you know, it's all kind of a combination of it. And to Booker's credit, you know, the, you know, there was that little kind of side conversation that, you know, they had, you know, him congratulating Luca on having the, on yeah. having the girl and, you know, a nice touch. And then Luca, Luca said, all right, watch this. And, you know, proceeded to drop 50 on him. So um, I, I, I just think it's awesome. I, I love seeing players have, you know, have those grudges against teams for whatever reason. And I think there's a lot of reasons for Luca to, to have that against Phoenix and, if if there was any team he was going to do it against, it was going to be the Clippers or the Suns. I feel like I, I think he, like he marked it on his calendar. He knew, you know, we've got we've got both those, you know, both those games in the same week. So I, I think he kind of he kind of figured it was going to happen one of those games. So, um, you know, it's it's just it's awesome to see, man. It's it, we're so blessed to be able to go from Dirk to to Luca and and you know for him to be a part of this team and for us to get to watch him on a nightly basis is is awesome because you know a lot of other NBA franchises don't get that opportunity. That's a perfect segue into what I was going to say is a lot of franchises don't see it every night unless you have, you know, league pass or you're really watching, but just overall, you know, it's, it's really a blessing that we get to watch him on a nightly basis and it's not glorifying him. It's just being just 
speaking real because that's what it is because when you know we, when we see him on an every night basis or just watch him in pregame or um, practice or just uh, in, in press conferences we really take for granted you know that he is in Dallas and it really doesn't sink in until you see him on the road where you know just like when Wimby came to town and in Dallas everybody was watching um, him and everyone was talking about him that's how it is with Luca when he goes on the road you know because they don't have that every night opportunity 40 um, 41 games a season to watch him so it, it's it's very surreal having him in Dallas and, and it's just very surreal with the accomplishments and achievements that he's had at 24 years old that's the that's the real uh reality of this is he's only 24 and if he continues the path that he's on just imagine the records and the achievements that he'll have at 28 or or 30 (laughs) it's really uh, astonishing what he's doing at this this point in time and obviously like you mentioned uh with, with some of the talks of top five or or mvp or championship you know those conversations it's really tough to have because uh, specifically MVP, well, where I'm at with it is he is at least top three in the MVP right now because when you look at what he's doing on a nightly basis and he really should be number one. I mean, obviously, team record is always one of the arguments when it comes to Luka Doncic, but when you look at the deep dive uh you know reality of what's going on in Dallas is you mentioned it earlier I mean they they should be it should be a bottom 10 team right now when you lose Kyrie for what 15 games and you lose um, role players on the team for over five games and it's only been 30 games in the season 32 games in the season so far you would think they would have a slow start but Luca has kept his team afloat and also the role players as well, making their shots and playing good defense. Like they're in December, they're 12th ranked defense in the league. Yep. And so, you know, Exum, Derek Jones Jr. And also um, Lively are playing more minutes. So that obviously attests to that, but you still are surprised, but not surprised what Luca is doing on a nightly basis. I mean, having triple doubles in the first half, having 30 points in the first half, or you know just some of the stuff he does and and then at the at the end of the day you're not surprised cuz it's Luca it, and that's what's that's what's so shocking i mean this guy has four all nba first team selections at 24 24 it's ridiculous it's ridiculous and he's averaging 33 9 and 8 i mean honestly let's just be honest here and this is not because we talk mavericks let's just be honest here if if Jason Tatum, Devin Booker, who was uh, Zion, mm-hmm. or you know, um, if, if Shay, if these guys, and obviously they're all playing styles are different, mm-hmm. but if these guys were averaging thirty three nine and eight, I don't care where the record is at. I mean, they're still Mavs are still a six seed, so it's not like they're at the bottom of the league, mm-hmm. but. If you're a top six seed and one of those guys are averaging 33, nine and eight, I promise anyone that they would be number one in MVP voting right now. hundred percent. And that's the problem because we all, and I'm just saying we all at this point are comfortable with Luca's greatness. And then at the NBA national media level, they're not highlighting it. And that's the problem because, if those guys I mentioned were averaging 33, nine and eight, and we're on a top six C team, most of them are, Mm -hmm. um, and you know, averaging those stats in in, at the efficiency, not just stats, but efficiency as well in the shooting splits, every single show, FS1, ESPN, whatever you have, NBA.com. I mean, would have them, number one in MVP voting and they would be talking about them on a nightly basis until they have a bad game. Yep. That's crazy. No, it's you're you're absolutely right. And that's 
funny you say that because that will get us into our you know our mailbag has a has a very oh, yeah. <laughs> a very specific question to to what you just mentioned um but you know it's it, the national media stuff i mean we've talked about it you know on on the podcast and and offline as well it's 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 infuriating sometimes just the hate you know that, that not just you know the mavericks get or luca gets Kyrie gets dallas sports as a whole i mean you know it's just it's kind of like we get put put to the wayside you know it's only it's only when the cowboys lose a game that you know they're talked about you know extensively for for six straight days oh, until don't Friday. Even get me started on them yeah rangers win the world series and there's like two segments on it in national media but if it's the yankees it's let's spend a month and a half talking about how the yeah, yankees okay. are the greatest team in baseball history like it's just like come on you know so it's you know that's a whole a whole different conversation and, and really i don't even know what the reasoning is behind any of any of the bias there but um yeah, I mean, he's playing at an MVP level, and, and it's unfortunate that the MVP now, like you said, is a is a record based award. It, it's generally going to go to the the first or second seed in in either conference, and I think that's why you see again Joel Embiid and and Nikola Jokic kind of at the top of the MVP leaderboard. If you look at you know kind of what the odds are right now, and it's you know why Luca is fifth. You know, I I don't understand. It it makes no sense to me, but. Um, you know, the, the only thing we can do is just appreciate him for, for what he is. And, 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 you know, you brought up a good point of, of, you know, the player that he is and, and at such a young age and, and going back to the maturity that he's kind of gained, you know, you hear teammates like Derek Jones Jr. talk about how different it is to play with a guy like Luca, like how he makes everybody better. You know, he puts people, he puts teammates in a position to succeed. And I think you can see, you know, for the first time in a couple of years, genuine joy, you know from Luca, like as he's playing, you know, I think he, he really enjoys the teammates that he plays with, you know, the praising of other people, you know, he talks about, you know, in post game, you know, after the Phoenix, when he said, you know, we got, we got lively back, you know, we need to get Kai back, you know, we need to be a full strength. This isn't the best version of us. Like we can be better. That's what you want to hear from your leader. And I think, yeah. I think you couple that with just the way he plays the game. I mean, he's in my mind, he's a top three player in the NBA and he might even be number one right now. I, I just I, I don't I don't think anybody or anything could, could convince me otherwise. Right on. OK, Sean Navaz, uh this is always your your segment of the show. Um, the mailbag. What do we have for the mailbag? Let's do it. All right. So our mailbag today, we've got five questions today. So first off, appreciate everyone who uh, who submitted questions. I kind of pick and chose um, five of the ones I think were were the most worthy of, of being talked about. So thank you to, uh, uh, to these, to the following folks for, for submitting these. So the first one comes from, uh, Manja McSessive. That's at Manja Mexi movie. Um, Manja asks, how is it possible that the Luca magic goes under the radar so much? Uh, and, um, why should we be thanking our lucky stars to be alive right now? <laughs> um, I certainly am. That should do it. And that goes back to what we just talked about, right? Is why, why is this, why is Luca just not talked about as much as, as other players to your point? Well, dang it. Now I'm mad that we talked about it already. <laughs> <laughs> as I said, it's a perfect segue into it. You're right. And, and it, I, I'll just leave it with this. I feel like he is talked about um, because he, he, I mean, he has four All NBA first team selections, uh, but at 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 the magnitude of how he should be talked about is not there, and yep. that's the whole issue that we have is the things that he is doing at this young age. He really should be the next face of the NBA. I mean, I wrote about it, we talked about it, but because every single time you see him uh reach an achievement or the accomplishment that he's had i mean he's getting comp he's he's beat uh, you know he's getting compared to um you know oscar robinson mm -hmm. lebron michael jordan larry magic. bird like, magic it's like all these records are associated to greatness yep. and he's 24 years old um even prime james harden like he's getting associated to MVPs or just all timers and and that's really scary cuz we're so comfortable with it but at the same time we should be hearing about it 
every single time an NBA show comes on our cable TV. What's yep. your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think I think there's a there's a discourse between what we see, you know, as as you know, fans of Dallas Mavericks, and and you know, for us people who are, you know reporters on on the Mavericks, I think we are obviously up close and personal with it. But I think from a national perspective, there's you know, there's obviously some discontent with Kyrie, you know, um, the, the national media loves to talk about that's true. Kyrie's struggles. They don't like Mark Cuban very much. Um, you know, yeah. with Luca, it's always, Oh, he complains too much or he does too much. You know, the Mavericks need to put more around him. Um, you know, there's no, there's no credit to, you know, to what has been done and as well as the Mavericks have been playing this year. Um, you know, it's, it's, it all, it's always, oh, the Jalen Brunson fiasco, or it's, you know, why did you make the trade to get Kyrie Irving? But before that, it's, well, you need a second star. Okay, well, then when you make the trade for a second star, it's, well, you gave up too much. Okay, I don't see Spencer Dinwiddie or Dorian Finney-Smith making all NBA teams or winning, you know, winning championships. You know, Kyrie has all of that. So, yeah, I just yeah. I, I just think there's a there, there's a media, a national media bias towards towards the Mavs and, and towards Dallas sports in general. Um you know, and, and I don't think that's anything that's going to, you know, be overcome. I mean, they want to see Luca in New York or in Miami or in L.A. Um, and that's what they always lead their shows with. Right. It's let's talk about the Lakers and why are the Lakers, even though they're struggling, why are they going to be, you know, the best team in the world? You know, why are you know, why is Jalen Brunson? You know, is Jalen Brunson a top five player in the NBA now? There was a, a conversation about that after, you know, um, a couple of weeks ago. And it's just like I, I, I understand like your your contracts and stuff. You have to talk about the biggest markets, but let's, let's take a side, let's take a step back and like, let's assess the NBA as a whole. And if you really want to get into it, there's no way, again, you can't tell me that Luka Doncic is not a top three player in the NBA. And, and I agree. He should be talked about more. It's unfortunate that he's not, but you know what? The hope is that one day, you know, hopefully within the next couple of years, they're going to have to talk about it once he brings the championship back to Dallas. I also think there's a flip side to this. I think it's also, because he's an international player. That's uh, true. I feel like that's the probably could be the biggest reason. I mean, you see how much the league um, promotes Jason Tatum or mm -hmm. Devin Booker or um, even Zion or, you know, just these players, um, Anthony Edwards, you know, yep. John Morant before the issues um, started uh, off the court. But, uh, you know, uh, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, like these – obviously LeBron James, but these are the players that they're pushing. And um, you, you see at the same time in parallel to it, the top five players in the NBA right now are international. Yep. I mean, Jokic, Luka, uh, Joel, Giannis, and Shea. Yep. I mean, that could be a reason too. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with that. Um, next question. This one is kind of interesting, actually, and I want to get your thoughts on it because. I think it's a, there was a little back and forth on Twitter between some of our followers on this. This one comes from, uh, at the Garcia kid underscore. Uh, yeah. why do you think the Mavs organization as a whole isn't transparent with the fans when it comes to reporting injury timelines? feels like such a secretive thing. In addition to the occasional smoke and mirrors from Cuban, or is that normal across the, the league? Ooh, so that's interesting. Um, I honestly don't think it's a fans thing. I think it's a media thing too, because they don't they don't tell us either. I mean, uh, it's it's really what it is, because we ask about it all the time. But kid always says, "Hey, that's the training stuff. That's I'm not a doctor, you know." Because he 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 lists the injuries before every press conference, and there's always someone injured, and and there's always someone to ask any update to Kyrie, any update to Maxi, mm -hmm. and. The, the answer is always, I don't have one at this time. They're getting they're uh, you know, with Kyrie, he's getting better, but um, Max is just a wait and see. So it, like, it's not just a fans thing. It's, it's a media thing. I think if, if they told the media, I think the fans would know. Um, so I don't think it's a fans thing, but I think as a whole, um, the reason that they could be hold it with, with um withholding information um honestly don't know I, I i i i wish i could have the answer but maybe they don't know 
And that's yeah. how injuries are. I mean, I've been injured. Um, have you have you been injured before? It's a really bad. Well, it wasn't a bad injury. It's a. Stupid. Should we say it on the pod? Uh, uh, maybe we, maybe not. <laughs> I, I was playing football against some kids that were bigger than me when I was like ten years old, and I broke my front tooth in half. That's oh, the, that's the biggest injury I've ever had. <laughs> oh dang! It's awful. I had to go to school with half- playing some uh, NFL Street. Remember yeah, that game? <laughs> yeah, something like that. It was like a lock in, you know, with a bunch of kids, and I ended up trying to tackle somebody that was like two hundred pounds bigger than me and knocked Ooh. my front tooth out and. Had to go to school the next day with half a front tooth, and I got made fun of. And it, you know, Dang. when you're a kid, it's just it's awful. I'm sorry to bring that up, Sean. About us, it's, it's traumatic, Landon. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have nightmares now. I'm so sorry about that, Sean. Us. <laughs> well, uh, if it helps, that you have a, a beautiful smile. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, so my point to that was, every injury is different, and you you you. You, you you want to see over time how, how it plays out because at the beginning they do say this player will be reevaluated in two weeks. This player will be reevaluated in um, three weeks, you know, stuff like that. They used to do that with the Mavs players, but with Maxi and with, if Ky, with Kyrie, I mean, there, there, there is no update. Yeah. I, and I don't think it's anything secretive. I don't think there's any like, you know, shadow games going on. From Mark Cuban's perspective, uh, you know, I think the NBA as a whole is doing is trying to cut down on this. I don't want to say load management, right? But I, I get it from the perspective of a fan because it's like you're paying money to come, especially on road games, right? Somebody who's yeah. coming in, Luca's coming in, you like know, the Timberwolves. Yeah, Steph's coming in, LeBron's coming into your town, and and you know you want to watch them play. And some families, you know, that's the one thing they save up for all year is you know we want to go to this game. And you go and, and that player is being rusted, right? And it's like, okay, you know, well, that, that's kind of a waste. We came here to see Luca or to see LeBron or whatever the case may be. Um, so, and, and the NBA obviously has instituted these new rules of, you know, hey, to get awards, you've got to play X number of games, you know, and I think that's cutting back on on some of this. But I, I don't think there's any, any, you know, behind the scenes, like, you know, where it's Mark or Nico or, or Jason Kidd trying to, trying to play games with the media and, and not let them know what the injury situation situation is. I think to your point, it's kind of just, we'll see it as it goes, right? Like some days are better than others, you know, especially when you've got injuries like Kyrie does where it's your heel, his entire game is predicated off using his legs, you know, like you can't shoot yeah. without, you know, using your legs. He can't all handle, he can't dribble. It's, you know, it's it, it, something like that. Like, I, I think the best thing we can do is we just have to trust the training staff and trust, you know, the information that we're given at that point, because what, you know, who knows every day is different. You, you know, like you said, you've been injured before, you know, I know, I know people, my wife's had, you know, major, you know, ACL surgery and I've got friends who have had significant injuries before and every day, you know, one day is better than the, than the next, right. When it comes to rehab and when it comes to being able to be in a position to, you know, to do day-to-day -day activities. And in this case, when it's your job and you don't want to, run the risk of reaggravation. you know, you've got to take necessary precautions. So I think, I think you just like, to your point, you know, you, you kind of just go with the information that you're given from the trainers and, and from the coaching staff and you go from there. And I think it's, let me just say this. So Dion Calhoun is the Mavs head athletic trainer. He's, he's, he also works with the USA basketball mm -hmm. team. So it's, he's one of the best in the country when it comes to NBA players. Um, so definitely trust him. And also at the same time, it's obvious that we're seeing progressions with, 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 uh, the injuries that the maps have had, like, no, I'm talking like visually, yeah. like we saw Kyrie in the walking boot and crutches. Then we saw him without crutches. Then we saw him without the walking boot. And now he's doing on court activities, you know, lively was in the walking boot. Yep. Then, then we saw him do on court activities. Josh Green elbow sprain. He had that last year, mm -hmm. so it was a re um, aggravated injury from last year. Um, it was the same injury, and you know we saw him get better. Now he's playing. I think the one thing that's really talked about um, when it comes to this topic is Maxi Kleba because it is yeah. an, it is a secret. I mean, the the reason that they aren't um, giving us things does give you um an opinion on them hold withholding information because 
a toe dislocation, I'm no doctor, but I mean, that could be what a few weeks or that could be two months um, or it could be a couple weeks. You just don't know with the toes. It, that's always an injury. You, it, the timeline, the, the range is so big, but we're not getting updates. So that's one thing I do feel like there are withholding information just to give us an update saying, because we don't see them in a walking boot. We right. don't see them with crutches. We don't see them on the court. So there has to be some sort of update and we're not getting that. Yeah. And I'm wondering, it's the same question I had before is did he re was there, is there still some lingering effects of that hamstring injury from last year? So like, that's, that's why the topic, that's, that's why the, the question is being asked because what's going on. We don't know. Yeah, yeah, we don't. So I do feel for that. No, I totally understand that. Um, all right, let's move on to our next question. Two questions, kind of same, pretty much the same question. So I'll give credit to both these guys. Uh, and I'll summarize what their question was, but, uh, Travis, uh, at Travis Rorig and at, uh, J, uh, uh, Sapoznikov, Joseph Sapoznikov, both kind of have the same question. Really? Um, a, do you think the Mavericks have addressed some of their biggest issues, uh, that we had over the off season? Um, and then, um, you know, what are your concerns moving into the second half, uh, of, of this year? Uh, and what do you see the plans are from a trading perspective uh, to upgrade either the four or the five? Or, you know, what are some of our beliefs on, on what the Mavericks are going to do? Oh, so that's a past, present and future, and future question. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yeah. OK, so first question, do they address their needs from last season? And I think, yes, they did. Um, first of all, they found the starting center. Yep. That that was the biggest need. Uh the second uh need or the second issue was do Luca and Kyrie play together? Can they play together? I think that was addressed that they can. Obviously health is a big reason. Um we haven't seen that, but when we have seen it, they have played great together and won together. Mm -hmm. Um and the third thing was pace. Uh the pace has been way faster because the Mavs were a slow team last year and in previous years, and now they're like eighth in the league. And, and you've seen that uh, affect Luka um, in a positive way um, if um, he has the condition now to do that. And also, and, and also his ability to play that tempo um, and getting the ball out of his hand sometimes. Kyrie pushes up the ball when it, you know it's inbounded. Um, so that's great as well. And you see the pace also influence Exum and Derek Jones um, Jr. Uh, even Hardaway is getting up more shots. Uh, Lively, he's playing great in that in that role. Um, we haven't seen much of Josh Green yet, but hopefully he plays better. And um, I think those were the main issues. I mean, obviously the fourth issue, Jason Kidd, uh, I think. He has been better at times and he has been worse at times. I think he's still a TBD for me um, to get the um, get how his coaching is in to, um, totality of the season, because honestly, I don't think he's as bad as people say he is, but, yeah. but I don't think he's as good as he think he is. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think because we wouldn't know about Exum if it wasn't for him to push Exum over other players. Um, he pushed uh, Derek Jones Jr. over other players, yep. and he benched Powell um, and Maxi for Lively in the second game of the season, and that's worked out as well. He he um, pushed for pace being high, he, and he's he's orchestrated um, an offense to work with Luca and Kyrie. We don't see them um, fumble clutch situations they're one of the best clutch teams in the league it would be better if they beat the Cavs but um yeah. you know they're top five clutch in the league so I think they addressed last season so the present uh what was the present question um really what do you uh what's what are your biggest concerns going into the second half of the season? oh yeah oh of course health that's yeah. the number one is health because honestly we, we haven't seen a good sample size of this team healthy. What we have seen 
was great, but they played bad teams. Mm -hmm. So they we need to see them healthy against even middle of the road or great teams to really assess how this team is. So I say health is number one. And then uh, trade deadline was the last question. Yeah, what kind of moves do you see? Do you see Dallas oh, make? We kind of already talked about this. I mean, obviously, um, at trade deadline, I don't see them making a move for a third option or a third guy. I, I I would say right now, without messing the chemistry or trading away good players, um, you know, because to get a good starting player, you have to you make give some, up yeah. your great pieces, and you really don't want to trade Exum or Derek June, Jones Jr. or those type of players to get a good starting player or third option. So I would say right now, a, a backup five mm -hmm. is what I would love to see. You know, a player like. Um, Olenek or yeah. um, a player like um, probably won't get traded, but uh, the Hornets back up Nick Richard, yeah, uh, Richard, Nick Richard, Richard yep, um, player like him, those type of players for a backup five because Grant Williams is good in spurts, but he can't play a full time backup five because that's why you see Pal playing, you know, 10 minutes a game when they're healthy. So yeah. um, someone that can just play eight to 10 minutes a game um, as the backup five. Those are the, that's a, that's a lot of questions, but hopefully <laughs> I answered them. Sean of Oz, what's your thoughts on that one? I think you, those are, that was perfect, man. I mean, I, yeah, I think, I think, and we've talked about this a lot, I, you know, the Mavericks need going in and, and Jason Kidd said it going into the off season, right? We needed rebounding. We needed more, more of a physical presence. Um, you needed better on ball defenders, especially after losing Dorian Finney Smith last year. Um, and they, I think they did a great job. Like, Derek Jones Jr. is probably your best defender right now. And look, the Mavericks don't blow out Phoenix without Grant Williams on Kevin Durant, you know, so for all of Grant Williams' troubles offensively, defensively, he's been very, very good. Um, and Lively has been a revelation. You know, it's everything Derek Lively Jr. or Derek Lively II, excuse me, is everything that we've wanted, you know, that, you know, that Mavericks fans wanted as a center. And I think what, what the organization wanted. Um so I, I think they 100% adjust their needs. They re-signed Kyrie, which, you know, I know was a point of contention for national media um, going into the season because they wanted him to, to go to L.A., but he's clearly happy here. Um, you know, you can kind of, even on the bench, man, like you can see Kyrie like cheering on his teammates and, and you know, having fun with Luca and, and with his teammates and stuff. It's a, a version of Kyrie I don't think we've seen in, in a long time. So um, I, I think they definitely addressed all their needs in the offseason. Um, my concern going into the, the second half of the season, to your point, health is, is crucial. And I think that's for any NBA team, you know, like I, teams like Phoenix are banking on Bradley Beal staying healthy. You know, the, the Lakers again are struggling. Uh, Aaron Gordon being out for the Nuggets, like that's a big loss for them, Ooh, yeah. uh, you know, over the next couple of weeks for as long as he's going to be out. So, you know, I think every team is, is struggling with, with health. And that's kind of always the, the question is when can we get all of our guys healthy or can we get everybody healthy by, and that's yeah. why the Thunder are doing so good and the yeah. Timberwolves are doing good because no they're, they're healthy. Yeah. I mean, Chet goes down, Carl Anthony Towns goes down, like that changes the entire trajectory of their seasons, right? So I think I think health is is, is super critical. Um, and then I just, you know, not necessarily a concern because I think we've seen the elevation of Exum and, and Derek Jones Jr. kind of mask some of the the poor play of other players, but I want to see Josh Green get into a rhythm. I know, you know, we, we talked about the struggles he's had and, and the disappointment that he's been this season and, you know, re-aggravating an elbow injury, I'm sure is not fun. Um, and we saw some rust, you know, over the last couple of games with him playing um, and coming back. I just want to see that confidence and I want to see, you know, I want to see him be able to, to kind of take, you know, take advantage of the situation because he's going to get playing time. You know, he's a, he's a good enough defender where he's going to be on the court um, I want to see him take advantage and keep taking shots, even if you're missing, like get, get, get in rhythm, you know, like it, it's hard to come back from that, that long of an absence. And, um, you know, and, and there's obviously a press, you know, a, a, from a personal standpoint for him, I'm sure there's a need to kind of make an impact immediately, but I think he just needs to play his game, you know, and get in rhythm and, and Luca and Kyrie are going to find him. Um, and then at the trade deadline, like you said, we talked about it, a backup, center would be ideal you know kelly olenic i think is a perfect fit you know because he can shoot the three as well um you know he's a guy who's going to be you know uh, in demand from a lot of teams 
uh, I think, you know, just from a backup perspective, I know there was a report that Boston was in, interested in bringing him back. Um, mm -hmm. That's a guy that, you know, that could be, that could be on the Mavericks radar. Um, I, I agree with you. I don't think they're going to make a huge move. I think that uh, you're going to see that in the off season when you've got the, you know, the ability to trade future picks um, after the draft. I think that's when you'll see if the Mavericks decide to make a huge move, it'll be then. Um, but I think, Every, you know, all these contracts other than Luca and, and, and Kyrie are kind of structured where you can move pieces. You know, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what the Mavericks do with Hardaway because of the fact that his deal is expiring. He's going to be a free agent. I think he's balled out this year. I think he's, he should be in the, you know, in the running for six man of the year. Um, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the Mavericks kept him the, the way he's been playing, but I could see, maybe a swap for another expiring deal, you know, with another shooter or a younger shooter, maybe who's, who's got, you know, a couple of years under contract that, um, that kind of fits what the Mavericks do. But I think that's going to be um, really interesting to see is, is what, you know, what, what, what happens with Hardaway Jr. Um, as, as the trading deadline approaches. Yeah. All right. And the last question that we've gotten, and this one, this one's kind of, uh, uh, this one comes after the, uh, the Cleveland game <laughs> a couple of nights yeah. ago. Uh, so this one is from the, uh, from at MVP Luca 77, whose Twitter handle or whose Twitter name is the fire Jason kid podcast. Uh, oh, wow. why are the Dallas Mavericks so bad in last possession? One score games. Um, they have one of the best, arguably one of the best closers in the game and they can't get him a shot. It's a pattern for this team and clearly hasn't been addressed. Why, how, and what's the solution? Well, why, how, and what's the solution is Kyrie. <laughs> I mean that, that's that's simple because you saw it in the Cavs they double yep. I mean they double Luca and really force it out of his hands where he can't get a shot and that fiasco was just it was just bad but like when you have Kyrie I mean you can get it out of Luca's hands and pass it to Kyrie he's able to get those shots he's all able to make um one of the toughest shots in the world. I mean, it, that's who he is. Mm -hmm. He has a proven record to do that. And I, I think that's the only reason you're seeing issues because when he was healthy, Mavs were the best clutch team in the league. So that's what it really boils down to is Kyrie. I think it's simple. Yeah. And I, I think that frustration, I get it. Cause it boils over from last year. You know, the, the number of one possession games that the Mavericks lost. I don't, and remind, correct me if I'm wrong, Landon, but I don't think the Mavs, Played in quite a few clutch games, but like you said, one of the best clutch teams in the NBA. Um, I don't think we've played in very many one score games, right, or one possession games like that. Like, no, I, but they all been within five points. Within in the five last... points, yeah. But... And so, I, I think I, I don't think it's it's as big of an issue as it was last year. Um, and and to your point, Kyrie coming back solves that issue. I think a it, it, you know you put another elite closer on the floor next to Luca, then it's up to the defense, which one of them are you going to guard? Um, and I think they, I think both of them have the instinct where if the other one's double teamed, like it, like that Cleveland game, right? Luca gets double teamed and Seth is standing there in the corner. Kyrie, I think would have the instinct to run up and, and get the ball and make a play. And, yep. you know, th that's just the role of guys like Seth Curry and Dante Exum in that situation and whoever else to Hardaway who's on the floor is to stand behind the three-point line or try to get the best shot off possible, right? The ball's going to go to Luca, but from their perspective, it's sit and wait because he'll make the pass. A guy like yeah. Kyrie is going to go get the ball from him and attack and kick it out, take a tough shot, whatever. But you, you, put, you put the trust in guys like Luca and Kyrie to make that. And I think you, when you put both of them on the floor, I think that, to your point, solves that issue. I also think it was a bad move from Kid to have Lively. In, yeah. in a game where it's the last play and you're down three. Yeah. So that doesn't make sense. I mean, you should have all five players who can shoot a three and they won't, um, you know, press as much as they did leaving someone open. So I, I think Kid could be better in that instinct without Kyrie. You got to yeah. be creative. Yeah, and I don't think the Mavs – I don't think that last possession – Come, is is the reason the Mavs lost? The Mavs lost that game before. Oh no, yeah, but, they were up twenty. I mean, that's it's ridiculous. Yeah, when you can't hit a shot to save your life in the fourth quarter, like it's just, I mean, and, and you you let it come down to that, like the, the pressure just completely swings over to you, 
you know? Yeah, and exactly. I think the Mavs lost that game way before that. So, yeah, yes, the second half was bad, and the fourth quarter was atrocious. Yeah, yes, there's a chance to tie it, but, I mean, you know, just the way that the Mavericks kind of crumbled in, in that game. You know, and, and hats off to Cleveland, because like we said, they're, they're by defensive rating, they're the best defensive team in the league. So, even okay. without Evan Mobley and without Donovan Mitchell. So, hats off to them for, for locking down in the in the second half, but the Mavs have to be better in that situation and, and can't let it get to... When you're up by 20, you can't let it get down to a one-possession game. No. And that's it for the mailbag, man. That was a good mailbag. Yeah, that I like had, it. Had us thinking a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That uh, the best time, though. Yes. So our last words of the podcast episode, New Year's resolution. So Sean of Oz, this time you go first. What is your New Year's resolution for the Dallas Mavericks? You kind of mentioned a few of them, but what is the main yeah. res- <laughs> New Year's resolution? I'm going to, I'm going to stick with health, man. I, I, I want to see, I want to see this team at full strength again. I think, I've said it before. I think they can make noise. I, I think we saw what this team's capable of. It, it feels like we haven't, it feels like the Mavericks haven't had the entire team. And I'm not counting Maxi in this because, like you said, I don't think we really know what's going on. But yeah. I don't think the Mavericks have had everyone at full strength in, in quite a while. You know, I think everyone's been playing with some nicks and bruises um, here and there. Um, but with Exum moving into the starting lineup, I think it gives you another another ball handler. You know, and I think it gives you another defensive presence, and it also gives you more depth now with Grant coming off the bench. You know, once yeah. Kyrie's back, so really, you know, when you look at a bench unit of guys like Tim Hardaway Jr., Josh Green, Grant Williams, Powell, Jaden Hardy, Seth, like that—that's a pretty deep bench. Like that's you've got a lot of of you know you've got obviously scorers, you've got a, a good role man in Dwight Powell. And a great defender in Grant Williams. I think that's one of the best. That there could be, could be one of the better bench units in the NBA. Um, and then yeah. you couple that with having Luca and Kyrie and and you know Derek Lively healthy in the starting lineup. I, I think that's a team that could that could potentially make some noise. But it, it's going to come down to health, and it's going to come down to to getting everybody on the right track as as we get into get into the new year. Because like we said earlier, January is a tough slate for this team. The Mavericks are Mavericks have a have a pretty difficult road. Uh, to start 2024 so it's january is going to be really telling about about who this team is and, and what they're capable of yeah and i think it's it's definitely tough because they have been injured mm-hmm. so um well it, it's even more tough if they stay injured yeah but i think once Kyrie comes back and like you said we won't even count maxi because who knows but just when Kyrie comes back we'll see how this team really gels and at that point Josh will have a few games under his belt to finally assess how he fits into the mold because he's been all over the place, to be honest. He he was positioned as uh, a starter, and then he was positioned as a top bench guy, and now it's just like he's just a guy off the bench. And that's, and that's my New Year's resolution. I was going to go health, but I want to do something different than you, and, but you already kind of said it because <laughs> – yeah, um, that's really what I want to see is Josh. I want to yeah. see Josh be a mainstay like he was last year. And at this point in time, I'm giving him a few games after coming back from injury. I mean, to get in the rhythm, like you mentioned earlier. But I want to really – because that's what it really boils down to. You have to be aggressive because, you know, I, I've seen the complaints about Grant Williams. And I've seen the complaints about Josh Green, like, and and the reason the complaints are there, even though they play solid defense, um, is because they're not aggressive on offense, and that's right. the problem because that's the strength of Dante and Derrick Jones Jr. Like they yeah. have even better off, I mean, even better defense, but still, they are aggressive on offense, like. They will shoot a shot if they have to shoot a shot. And they will drive if they have to drive. It's that simple. And that's where I think it comes to Grant Williams and Josh Green. And and obviously, I'm speaking specifically to Josh Green, um, is I want to see them – I want to see him aggressive because at least Grant Williams will shoot an open shot. Josh Green hesitates on open shots. And last year, it seemed like he got it down where he wasn't. He was trending up. He was driving and he was 
he wasn't hesitant on shooting shots. So I want to see that. I want to see the guy they gave the extension to because next year it's going to get a lot of attention if he's doing this. I mean, Mm -hmm. or, you know, because right now you could right now I see his name in trades. Last season, at the end of the season, I didn't see him name in any trades. You know, he was a mainstay. So now you're getting to a point where if he's not aggressive and Dante is thriving, you know, he becomes a a luxury for the Mavs to put on the trade block. But I want to see Josh Green thrive in Dallas and just be aggressive when he has the ball. Because at first you say, well, he's playing with Luka and Kyrie. But no. Look at Dante. Look at Derrick Jones Jr. They're playing with those players, and they're aggressive in their opportunity. Yeah, no, that's you're 100 percent right. I mean, it's I, I think we we need to see more from Josh Green, and like you said, he was trending upwards last year, and, and it's all about confidence for me. Every time I watch him, it's all about does he have the yeah. you know is he is he going to make the right decision? Is he going to is he going to drive? Is he going to shoot? You know, we've got it. We saw it last year. You know, we we were t- we talked about it extensively last year about you know we thought he was going to be the starter. Yeah, and and or it should be the starter. At, yeah, at the three, and and you know we said we wanted to see him get his confidence back up. We saw it a little bit, and you know it's unfortunate he got the injury. But to your point, let's give him let's give him a few games. Get you know get back into the rhythm and and prove why you why you got that extension. Yeah. So to that, we say happy holidays. We say happy New Year's to everyone. Hopefully, our New Year's resolutions come into effect for the Mavericks. Thanks to you all for listening, subscribing, and supporting uh, Mass Fans for Life.